Hanneman is our next presenter. She's Professor of Art Emeritus at Southern Methodist University, an acclaimed instructor. She's taught here. We love having her every time she does. She taught painting and drawing at SMU, as well as its noted color theory course. She was born in New Mexico, educated at the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. Her works are held in private and public collections, both nationally and internationally. This fall, the Pollock Gallery at Southern Methodist University's Meadows School of the Arts presented Emerita, a retrospective of Deborah Hunter and Mary Vernon. Michael Frank Blair said of her in 2017, Mary Vernon's legacy is living a certain kind of humanist ideal that holds the product of work, that, ho that holds that the product of work is always a more enlightened humanity. Mary is also a fellow of the Dallas Institute. Uh, I am going to talk to you about human-animal combos, or therianthropy, or theriomorphs, the kind that you know from Egyptian gods, where we regard the Egyptians traditionally as a little behind the times, having to put animal heads on human bodies. I've always been fond of that idea. I've always been fond of theriomorphs. And Several of them appear, as a matter of fact, in the James Hillman book that I illustrated, which you might, you might look at sometime. For instance, this cat with, with uh, opposable thumbs, um, and, and many other cases like that. I want to talk to you about the way those humans and animals join one another, and sometimes which one of those things is taking over the power uh, of that kind of joining, if in fact I know anything about that. Back to this wonderful guy later. Whoops. There we go. Um, as you know, there are many places in animal presences where Hillman hints at this kind of possibility, the possibility of the artist being able to show some sort of joining of the human with the creaturely eye. And those are the things I want to show you. The visual artists try at showing the glimpses that a human being might have through the, I'm not sure it's entirely the eye, through the being of the animal. Uh, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if um, you and I could all have a dream we were in together which happens almost never as far as, of course, there, there are analysts here who know better than I, but that so rarely happens. But Shakespeare can arrange it and <laughs> arranges it in Midsummer Night's Dream, where the, where the chief participants in the story enter a forest which is dark and cave-like. And as soon as they enter the forest, things start to go dream logical instead of the kind of logic that we accept in the world. You start to have opinions that you never would have had. You start to feel shames or prides that you never would have felt. And at the center of that kind of, of dream logic is a man with an animal's head. A person who was, I presume, human-headed, uh, it says so in the story, and then he gets this animal head, bottom, with an ass's head, the, providing the wonderful joke that there's a guy named Bottom with his head up his ass. It's, it's all very amusing. Uh, but I always wonder within that dream, with the animal head on the body, whether actually Bottom gets anything out of the ass's mind. Hmm. There is no hint in Shakespeare that he comes to understand the beast, uh, unless he is himself a beast and therefore doesn't need to do this. But it is true that Quince, his friend, says to him when he sees Bottom, bless thee, Bottom, bless thee, thou art translated. And it's that kind of translated human that I want to talk about, either willingly, unwillingly, successfully, unsuccessfully, the translated human uh, or the theriomorph. This kind of thing 
the insertion of the animal on the human costume. This is so common uh, a trope that, it, that everybody does it and it's easy. Of course the ancient Egyptians did it, but everyone does it. And it's so easy to do digitally and we seem never to get tired of it. <laughs> it's so easy that I do it. Uh, this, is a, this is a painting of mine called Ferret in Disguise, which is, uh, although it does not state that anywhere in the painting and you don't need to know it, it is actually a comment upon a role Peter Sellers played in one of his movies, um, I'm All Right, Jack, because that's Peter Sellers' suit from I'm All Right, Jack, that the black-footed ferret is wearing, but you don't need to know that. This trope of animal head on human clothing body is standard. We do this all the time. And the reason we do it, I leave up to more expert minds than mine. <laughs> um, this, is the, this is the opposite, and I think it's a bit more disturbing. <laughs> uh, this is the work of Kate Clark, who's one of the best of the current rash of taxidermy sculptors. Uh, taxidermy as a form of fine art sculpture is in is in bloom, let's say. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to be a wonderful idea. <laughs> uh, but she's very good at it. And the thing that is disturbing about the Kate Clark sculptures is that there's a different kind of feeling that perhaps the human head is more trapped within the, uh, in the animal body or that this creature, because it doesn't have an animal head, has less of the magic of the other. It's too human to actually be digested as one of those great animal presences. The body of the animal doesn't seem to be enough to handle this problem. She also makes the, the heads uh, of her human animal heads uh, animal colored so that a hyena head is hyena colored. We no longer have human coloration within the skin. And so it, the, the distance seems extremely upsetting. One of the most important of the theriomorphs or therianthropies is uh, the centaur. You're used to the centaurs of the Parthenon, um, noble, classic Greek centaurs, but there are lots of wonderful centaurs in visual arts that descend from them, and there are lots of wonderful ones in the Middle Ages, like this one, which is an aquamanil from Hildesheim. It's a little water vessel with um, a centaur a as, a, as a crowned guy fighting a dragon. And as you know, centaurs were useful to us in metaphorical terms, I guess, in, the, in saying that because of the percentage size of the body, the, the animal instincts were outweighing the human ones. More animal body, more lust. More likeliness to, to run off with brides at Lapith weddings and things like that. Naughty behavior on the part of centaurs, ungovernable. Um, he seems to be not that kind of centaur quite here. He seems to be mm, sort of in control and capable of killing dragons. He has one of the distinguishing features of a complete centaur, and that is horse front feet. And the famous centaur Chiron, uh, the one who taught Achilles and Perseus and Jason, Chiron apparently had human front legs and then horse back legs. And I consider that anatomically very dangerous. The weight of a horse body on human front legs seems risky to me, but I suppose it worked out all right. That percentage in Chiron may have made him wise in the metaphorical sense. That is, they say, well, Chiron was different. He wasn't so lustful. He had a higher percentage of human anatomy and therefore was more governed by good Greek reason than the sort of centaur that we regard as animalistic. By the way, if you have any desire to 
to comment or ask questions or heckle, please <laughs> do so. Please ask any question because I may have left something out. Um, the best sort of this kind of combination with the, with the human head and the animal body and everything else thrown in is the lamasa, which is the zodiac power. This is, this is the animal that has all animal power within it among the Assyrians. Uh, all the bovine, all the, all the equine, all the eagles, all the lion, all the human crown, everything complete and therefore capable of being a godly zodiac power, which made them wonderful guardian figures for the gates of palaces. I'm not even sure that there is any suggestion that this being has a human head. It may only be a god head that it has. In the, in the realm, though, of those, of those ones with those human bodies with animal heads on them that we have looked at before, probably one of the most beautiful examples is this this version of Circe turning Odysseus's men into animals, which is the creation by a demigoddess of theriomorphs of her own. She, she made her own uh, combos by giving them a, a wine stirred with her silver wand in a beautiful kylix. She stands in the middle stirring with her wand and the men of Odysseus around her are already transformed mostly, even with some animal legs. And then his man, Eurylochus, is escaping over here at the right, fleeing around the corner. And over there at the left, second from the left, is Odysseus arriving with his sword to try to solve this problem, which he eventually solves in a most erotic and interesting way. It's a kylix picture on a kylix, which of course is always a wonderful story, that the one you're drinking out of is, could be Circe's. She's stirring in a kylix, then you're drinking wine at a banquet, banquet out of a kylix, and you could conceivably turn into an animal in this way. Well, I wanted you to give you a few more glimpses of artists' visions of this powerful woman, Circe. Um, this is uh, John Waterhouse, uh, the, the great late, late 19th century British painter. Here Circe has already changed the, the beings into animals, and they still want more. It's a, it looks like a young Syrah in the, in the goblet, the great vessel on the table, a beautiful wine, and and it matches the glorious, scary red-headedness of Circe. And in the background, I find it interesting that the book is open, and it has what looks like a sign of the Illuminati. Many of you may be much more skilled in Illuminati sleuthing uh, than I am, but the, but the triangle within the circle is quite magic. It also, doesn't it happen to be the, mm, the emblem of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous? which, of course, doesn't apply in the Waterhouse painting. I'm sure that came along later. Sounds like a good warning to the animals, though. And here is a Circe that is totally contemporary. The difference between Waterhouse and us is this. Um, redhead, redhead dominatrix, with very little on, less on than she had on in the Waterhouse and delighted at the rage of her beasts. You see that the beasts are not uh, her captives quite anymore. They're more like her mercenaries. They are raging and coming after us with ferocity, and that's just how she wants it. It seems as if this is a clue to how we intend theriomorphs to behave. DC Comics has all our secrets. You know that. <laughs> this, is a, this is a contemporary artist, Paul Reed, stranded on the Isle of Circe. Paul Reed shows the 
the beast being set free by Odysseus. And Odysseus, in an interesting mixture of ancient sword and World War II boots, uh, he, has a, he has a carbine, I believe it's a carbine. He has uh, a, a, a rifle, and uh, the beasts come out really gloriously um, physically painted. And there are mysterious beasts still inside the shed. Paul Reed is an excellent concoctor of fantasies. Um, in the Denver Museum, um, there is a wonderful two-part painting. This is the left part of the painting. Called, it's called in, in the Denver Museum, the Game of Civetta. It's Fare la Civetta, playing the owl. It's by an Italian named Pietro Fabrice. Playing the owl in Italian is flirting. Um, and well, that's, that's the danger that's being shown in this wonderful 18th century painting. Um, there are men on horses far away. There is even a kind of castle. There are men on a hill in the near distance. They're complete. You get too close, however, to the circle of these magic women and you start to play the owl, or they play it on you, that, that hooing, cooing sound that is so seductive leads men to become man-headed owls, who in the whole painting can then be played with in indecent ways by charming owl-playing women. I don't know, although I've, I've looked at the painting carefully, Denver Museum won't, they don't seem to know anything about it really. Um, I can't tell if the men are suffering. I mean, I don't know if the men are, are getting their feathers pulled out or if they love this cuddling. I don't know which. It's very hard to tell in the painting. We've all been, we've all lived through the once and future king. And we all know that Merlin um, uh, shapeshifts the young Arthur called Wart into uh, a, a, a hawk, an ant, and a fish. In order to teach Wart war and the dangers of heavy communal living, and the bullying nature of American politics. Those are the three lessons taught by that kind of, those three types of animals. Leave that aside, um, you see that Wart and Merlin are what I would call characterized animals, a, a quality in 20th century animation, but also in 20th century thinking, in which the animal is almost entirely taken over by the character and behavior of the actor. So that the animal has to start looking like a boy or an old man. And you know that in some of the more famous animation movies, if any Murray is, Murphy is doing the, the voiceover, the, the animal he's doing starts acting and looking like Eddie Murphy. That's a characterization. It is a thin veil called an animal worn over a human who's completely in control. That, I think, is what's happening in, in a cartoon like this, where the owl is clearly the wise old man, and the younger bird is clearly the sharp, the sharp, cute wart. This has nothing, of course, to do with the animal. This is human with animal veils on characterization. You might say that there's such a thing as the opposite of characterization, in which the animal, uh, the, the human tries to become the animal for some reason. And in the case perhaps of shamanic hunting, it would be to become the animal so that you can stalk them. So unified are you with them that you're in danger almost of not being able to kill them because you are so unified with them. That's, that's said in a lot of interviews with 
shamanic hunters. But in Pueblo dances, I'm not sure that that is what is going on. The, in deer dances at places like San Ildefonso, the proper costume and the proper behavior, the right steps in the dance, the right mental attitude allows, I think, if I understand it, the spirit of the animal to enter into you so that you can act as the animal on behalf of nature. And in this Gilbert Atencio painting from the 50s, you can see that the spirit of something um, actually has one of its long waves, the center of its five long waves, reaching all the way into the back of the dancer, which must be a very important gesture on the part of the spirit. Well, this kind of a suiting up as animal in order to absorb the animal and represent it has, um, has a descendant in an interesting uh, performance artist called Thomas Thwaites. Thomas Thwaites is, um, is a, a long-run performance artist. That's the closest I can say. It's somewhere between a, a scholar, researcher, and a tinkerer. A person who takes on a project for a real and serious reason and then works until he has almost exhausted the physical possibilities of anything until he's finished. Sometimes it takes two or three years. In this case, I believe it took two. Um, his, his book, Goat Man, How I Took a Holiday from Being Human, it's a wonderful book to read. And I think you will be, I think you will be satisfied with his, his uh, intentions, judging from you know, the qualities that I see as valued in this conference, when you hear something that he says early in the book. He wants to be an animal for lots of reasons. By the way, it's not necessarily a goat that he wants to be as he starts out. He kind of wants to be an elephant. But it's very difficult to carry around that elephant costume on a human frame. You can't, you actually can't get that big as a human with the skeleton that we have. Small elephant wouldn't do any good. Treading lightly, that he's talking about elephants, I mean any animal, treading lightly on the earth, causing no bloody suffering, contentedly deriving your sustenance from the green plants growing all around, absorbed in your immediate surroundings, eating a bit of grass, sleeping on the ground, and that's it, galloping across the landscape free. Wouldn't it be nice to be an animal just for a bit? That's what we say all the time. Oh, if I could only be a horse, if I could only be an animal. Well, it takes him quite a lot of research and quite a lot of building and a grant, a big grant, to get anywhere near what he wants. Which ends up like this, with a costume mostly made by him and his mother, who made the, the white shirt and out of old rugby clothes and things like that. He's not, he's not, um, he's not filled with lots of assistance and an enormous high-tech facility. He does it all himself by hand. After years of research, well, perhaps six months, he decides to become a goat. In all of the animals that he researches, he meets exactly the same problem and the problem that he will meet as a goat, and that is that we don't have necks long enough to get to the ground. We're not meant to stand on four legs and eat off the ground. Our, we just aren't built that way. And that is indeed the problem that is hardest for him to solve. He can solve the engineering problems. After many tries, treadmills, scientists, things like that, he knows how to get front legs long enough and back legs with his heels high enough up in the air. But he can't eat grass. And once he figures out a way to just fall on the ground and eat the grass and then get up, he realizes he can't digest the grass. 
He's going to have to live on grass somehow, so he has to invent a drink that he can take in little doses that provides a digesting protein to his stomach that will digest cellulose, and that barely works. You can imagine the after effects of some of that kind of thing. I want you to read the book, of course, but I want you to think about what success would be in an enterprise like this. He defines success as really being taken as a goat by a goat or two, <laughs> requiring him to, to run with goats in, in Switzerland uh, in, a, in a herd owned by somebody he knows, and to cross an alpine ridge as a goat. He says, those are two things, if I could do those, I would have gone goat as far as I can. And I don't know how I'm going to live and eat, but let's go for it. He, he meets first success when he is given advice by a nanny goat, good advice. He has found that all these, he can roam around among the goats, they accept him, they're not disturbed by him, but he's, he doesn't understand the grazing pattern, he figures, because he starts going uphill on a nice meadow, and uh, the nanny goat comes after him and says, no, 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 you can't go up there, because the ur goats, the, the chief men goats of the tribe don't want anyone grazing uphill from them if they are taken to, if the stranger is taken to be a man, which apparently he's taken to be, for I have no idea why. The nanny goat keeps coming after him and saying, no dear, no, go back down. And as long as he does what she says, he has a wonderful time among the goats. So he has an advisor. And the next achievement is crossing an alpine ridge, which he manages to do. It almost kills him, but he manages to do it. With this, I say, we have come about as far from the idea of, that we began with, with the idea of a human uniting with an animal in some kind of understanding. This is uniting with the animal from the outside, and I admit, absurdist direction. But I think that it takes the animal seriously in trying to, to be one. Thank you.